All right, good morning. Um, uh, thank you for all joining in today. Uh, pretty much everyone here knows me, but today we got a special guest. Uh, this is our last class on climate justice, care for God's creation. And um, our, we have a guest that I just happened to meet, uh, uh, Maddie Dinan. Uh, 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 they were able to uh, allow us to, to, you know, to do this class for us. So um, I really appreciate it. Um, and I'll give you a quick little synopsis of her, uh, Maddie. Um, Maddie is the education program manager for Sound Salmon Solutions. Maddie grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, where her love of the outdoors was fostered by constant outdoor play and hiking trips with their family. They got their BS in biology, ecology emphasis from Loyola University, Chicago, where they researched the effects of climate change on aquatic in insects. After completing their degree, the degree, they moved to Washington for a AmeriCorps position at, as a program assistant for uh, Camp Fire Walla Walla. That's, <laughs> that's where Maddie's passion of educating uh, on the environment was born. As a result, they completed a master's in education in environmental education from Huxley School of Environment at the Western Washington University. Since then, Maddie has worked as an environmental scientist on a light rail extension project in the region and as a science teacher for elementary students before landing at uh, Sound Salmon Solutions. They absolutely adore the Pacific Northwest and their free time they can be found on the trails knee deep in wetlands and curled up with a good book. So let me stop sharing. And Maddie, Maddie I'm gonna put you as spotlight in one second. All right, you have the ball. All right, well, great. Thank you everyone so much for inviting me to be here today. I love talking about what I do and I love uh, sharing my passion with the world and my community. Um, like Marco said, I am the education program manager for Sound Salmon Solutions. And so I'm gonna share my screen here. Great. Um, so a lot of what I do and where I've been in my journey is covered in my bio, but a little bit more about kind of who I am and what I do is I have this passion for the environment and for science uh, and for the natural world. And I also have an, a passion for education and outreach and working with the public and working with kids and like really connecting with communities and bringing that science and that, you know, that passion for the environment to people uh, and showing them the, the, joy that can be found in their own backyards and their own communities and also what they can be doing in their own backyards and in their own communities because I think we see things on the news and we read about things and we have these different seminars and lectures and everything seems so doom and gloom and everything's really impending um, and scary uh, and we're in a crisis like that's I'm not gonna sugarcoat that but there is a lot that's happening on the fight to, I would guess, mitigate would be the right word, to mitigate the effects of climate change, especially on populations that are most vulnerable. Um, and so that is something I'm incredibly passionate about. So uh, my graduate degree, uh, my master's in environmental ed, I did a thesis on the impacts of taking children with ADHD um, out and doing like a nature therapy lesson with them. So it's just a, like a basic environmental ed lesson that I set to, uh, uh, nature therapy framework. And I took the kids outside, uh, and I did this lesson with them. And before the lesson, I counted the number of ADHD related behaviors that these students had. And then after the lesson, I did the same thing where I counted the number that, of ADHD related behaviors that the students had in their regular classroom settings around when I took them outside. And surprise, surprise, after bringing the kids in from outside, every single one of the students participating in the study saw a reduction in ADHD related symptoms after we spent time uh, outside doing nature therapy lessons. So there's so many ways that we can connect 
this work in such a broad manner. Um, and now that I am working in education, I also am itching for that, like sci that more science piece too. So I also am currently getting certified as a wetland scientist uh, at UW right now, just because I really, I love wetlands and I love being out there in them. And just the more knowledge that you have, the more power you have, knowledge is power, all of that. Um, I love being in the Pacific Northwest. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I love going back there and seeing my family, but um, I think I have found my home out here. So I really appreciate the welcome of the communities that I've been in and, and been here for the past seven years. So excited to keep going and working and uh, helping preserve this most wonderful and magical place. So for today, I wanted to talk a little bit about Sound Salmon Solutions, you know, who we are, what we do, uh, how we partner with the community, both like on small scale and larger scale, uh, the programs that we offer, and then bring it back around to what you all have been talking about and how our mission ties in with environmental and climate justice uh, and the change that we're doing that's in action, the actual steps that we're taking to make this viable change uh, that, that is something that is a gift for our future generations. Um, and it's really important for me that I am working in a field like this, uh, but also so that I can show others how they can do things just in their own time, on their own you know, limited amount of whatever bandwidth that you have at the end of the day. It doesn't have to be a full frontal attack. There are small things that individuals can do every day that can help mitigate this crisis that we have coming. Um, and so then we'll talk about different things that you can do with us or on your own uh, as part of being part of that bigger solution. So a little over 30 years ago, Washington State, uh, realized that our salmon populations were on an incredibly drastic decline. And by the time that we were, you know, catching it, the, the decrease was so steep um, eh, that it was alarming to the people involved. And so there was huge campaigns and like information pushes. And, and as a result, Washington state legislature chartered a uh, a system of organizations called Regional Fisheries Enhancement Groups, or RFEGs, so that we could help to promote the recovery of salmon in the region. There are 14 in the state. We are one of them. We are uh, Sound Salmon Solutions. We are also known as the Stilly Snohomish Fisheries Enhancement Task Force, but that's a bit of a mouthful. So that's like our legal name. And then our, our name that everyone knows us by is Sound Salmon Solutions. Um, but we've been serving the community for over 30 years. We've been doing the best we can to integrate our work within the community with our partners, with, with the, the local schools, with the local tribes, with the local community partners, such as yourselves and other organizations, because it takes, it takes everybody, it takes everybody. Um, so we believe in, sustaining and creating these communities devoted to salmon recovery, but not only that, devoted to their environment, devoted to their community, devoted to their future and their children's future and their children's children's future, because that's what it comes down to. At the end of the day, we're gonna see some of the effects of climate change you know, in our lifetimes, but it's gonna be the future generations that are really gonna suffer. The ones that were not even here, that weren't a part of it, that's not their fault, they're gonna be the ones inheriting it and needing to take care of it. And so if we can connect and do meaningful work for a common cause to help create a safer and more habitable, habitable place for our future generations, like that's one of the most important things that we can do in, in my personal opinion. Um, and we believe that anybody, anybody, anybody can help connect and contribute to that overall goal and mission. Um, and it's important that we share that with people as well. So here are the regional fishery enhancement groups. So you can see we're number three there, but up like in Whatcom, we got the Nooksack Salmon Enhancement Association. They're huge. Many, many people have heard of them because they're one of the bigger ones. Uh, they tend to get a lot of funding and they help out a lot of the rest of us, um, 
because they just have a, an incredible network up there. We have Skagit Fisheries, which is right north of us, then our region, which is the uh, Sound Salmon. We uh, are part of what's called Watershed 7, and we also are a little bit in Watershed 6. And if you don't know what a watershed is, it's um, a region of landscape where all of the water, like from the mountains, precipitation, snowmelt, all of that make their way to the ocean. And so we've kind of chunked them out into different regions. And the fishery enhancement groups somewhat fall along those lines, but they, they overlap a little bit. So like I said, we're, uh, we're part of two different watersheds uh, in our jurisdiction. Right below us is Midsound Fisheries, and we partner with them quite frequently, like Skagit and Midsound are um, big partners of ours, but we have weekly meetings. Um, I know the executive directors of all 14 meet weekly, the education program managers, we meet probably every other week. Um, and then the program managers just in general meet once a month for all of these uh, groups. And it's, it's a really about a partnership. We're all doing the same thing, but nothing's a competition. It's all like, how can we help and support one another? How can we assist you? What resources do you need? What help do we need? You know, very, very collaborative, um, very integrated group of uh, organizations that are really dedicated to seeing the betterment of the environment in all of Washington. So I kind of wanted to mention salmon as a keystone species because I think it'll help tie in why we talk about, you know, sound salmon solutions and we focus on salmon, but how it's so incredibly important just to the environment as a whole, because a keystone species is a species that is so vital to the food web and energy web and environment and ecosystem that it's part of that if you remove that species, many, many, many other species suffer and will decline and potentially even go extinct as a result of losing that number. So salmon are a keystone species in our ponds and lakes. They are a keystone species in our rivers and streams, and they are a keystone species in our oceans, which means they drive food webs and the environment and the ecosystem in all of those locations in every stage of their life from egg to death, they are driving these ecosystems. Um, so even after they, you know, swim upstream to spy, I mean, they, you know, they are food for predators and they are uh, predators themselves. They help uh, keep the insect populations in check. And even all the way through to their death after they spawn, salmon die right after they spawn, their, their corpses um, provide nutrients to the river uh, systems to the different like vegetation that's growing in and along the riverbanks and like just from again birth to death their whole cycle is so vital to the entire ecosystem that when we work on saving the salmon we are doing larger work where we are saving the environment and there are so many species that co-evolved with salmon which is again why removing them would be such a big deal like um, like wolves and bears and uh, birds and, you know, our southern resident orca, they all co-evolved with salmon as integral parts of their diets. It's the same with insects. All these insects have co-evolved with salmon. Um, they're what are called aquatic insects, which is uh, things like dragonflies and damselflies and mayflies and stoneflies and mosquitoes. Insects that have lay their eggs in water and then they spend their like larval stages in water and then emerge out of water. If we didn't have salmon, those insects would, would become overrun. And so they evolved with salmon to produce a lot of offspring uh, just as a you know, natural back and forth of the, the evolutionary process. But once we take salmon out of that picture, insect populations explode and these predator populations decline and it just becomes a whole ecosystem nightmare. And I'm sure you have seen in the news about our resident, uh, Southern resident killer whales and the population decline because their main and key uh, food source is the Chinook salmon and our Chinook are critically endangered. Uh, and the biggest reason because a lot of people think overfishing is the biggest reason, and it's one of the reasons, but the biggest reason that we have such a, an incredible decline is habitat loss. 
if they don't have places to go to spawn, they won't go spawn. And salmon are very uh, particular. When, when they're born in a certain place, that's the place they spawn. So if they're born somewhere and then that river gets, uh, you know, diked or culverted or otherwise obstructed and they can't go up that river, they're not going to go up another river. It's very particular that they have to go up that, that river. And this is where that habitat restoration really, really comes in and is really incredibly uh, helpful. And what we'll see when we do this restoration work is that once we provide those habitats again, they start to come back. So I also don't know if you all have heard of the Elwha Dam or the Elwha River. They had this huge dam on the Elwha uh, and it was built before our fish passing laws. And so we have laws in Washington where if you build a dam, it has to have ways for fish to pass through it uh, on things like fish ladders or other you know innovative ways that you get fish from one side to the other, uh, but this dam was impassable. And so it, it took out a lot of uh, um, estuary ecosystems. It took out a lot of, I mean, it killed a lot of the ecosystem behind it just because of that, that whole idea of salmon as a keystone species. Um, and without them, the ecosystem where they're not begin to die. Uh, so there was this huge push to have this dam removed and they did eventually get the dam fully removed in 2014. And since the dam removal and habitat restoration work has been done about uh, every year, about five to 10% more of the salmon population return every year. So when we do the work to actually recreate and give back the habitat that these, that these uh, salmon need, they come back, they're resilient. We just have to recognize what it is that's driving them. And for them, it's their home. They're trying to get to their home. And if they can't get to their home, they're, they're not going to spawn. They're not going to continue on that cycle. And then, you know, like in the case of the Chinook, when they die out and the Southern resident orca um, have them as a main food supply and have for millennia, and that's been their main, main food supply, they're not, they're not adapt to look for food elsewhere. And so a lot of them, you know, it's the, the population has been drastically reduced in size. I think they are just starting now to branch out to other salmon species a little bit, which we're really grateful that they're doing, but that it's a slow process because they did co-evolve with the Chinook and that whole system. It's quite possible still that that population will go extinct, extinct without like continued direct uh, purposeful recovery of the Chinook populations. Hey Matt, I got a question. Yeah. Um, so how much is like, you know, cause we've been talking about climate just or climate change. And so how much, you know, if, if, if our summers are getting hotter and hotter and the snow melt is actually going earlier and earlier and, and there's less uh, snow or there's less snow, how much does that affect the salmon population? That's a great question. It actually is, it hugely affects them in a couple of ways. Um, if we're talking just about a reduction in snow melt, if there is not enough water for them to get over the natural barriers in the river, they won't make it to their spawning sites. So just in the reduction of water, that is a huge problem. Um, and that is like solely that one piece, because another thing that'll, that'll cause that to happen is when we have sediment influx into our water systems, which happens with construction and a lot of like sediment that will also braid rivers, which will mean, you know, break them off into like shallower and shallower, which will also prevent salmon from coming upstream. So the shallow water is definitely a barrier. Another barrier that climate change specifically is inflicting on the salmon populations is it is warming up our streams and how the salmon life cycle works is when the eggs hatch is based on how warm the water is. So as the rivers get hotter earlier in the season, the eggs hatch sooner. And when they hatch sooner, they're, it, the sooner that they hatch in the season, the less of a chance that they have to making it to the old, uh, to the ocean and to adulthood because what's happening now too is like the water is getting warmer but then we'll have random 
big freezes after a period of a lot of warming. So they'll have hatched and then all of a sudden there's a big freeze again and that stunts their growth and that like causes other defects that prevent or make it that much harder for them to get to the ocean. So on top of all the predation, on top of the habitat loss, on top of all of the barriers that they already have to get to the ocean, when the water warms up and they're hatching at times that they shouldn't be hatching, uh, it also is hugely inhibitory um, and really can be, is part of a significant decrease or a significant part of the decline of salmon. Um, we do have, we do have things we're doing about that, but that's a really good question. Um, because I think, I mean, I, until I really started working with salmon more intricately, I didn't realize how, just how delicate that life cycle was and that balance was, or the fact that their eggs hatch literally based on the like very specific temp temperature of the water. Like once the water hits, like, I want to say 48 or 49 degrees, that's when they start to hatch. So it's been this heat balance in this uh journey and this uh evolution that they've been doing for millennia and millennia and it's changing so rapidly that their processes aren't keeping up with how fast things are changing with how fast the water is warming with the reduction of water or like a another problem with that would be a huge rush of water right so if if it gets really hot and we have a lot of snow melt at once then the water is moving a lot faster than they're used to and then they're it's that energy required to move upstream becomes that much harder because once salmon begin their journey back upstream to spawn they're they are no longer eating that whole journey their sole focus is to get to the end so the, all of their energy they acquire in the ocean they you know eat, eat eat in the ocean and then they're swimming upstream to get to their spawning uh locations but they only have enough energy to get there and spawn and that's usually why they die after so if there's again this current becomes so much stronger that they're fighting against that that much more energy that they're exerting to get to their spawning grounds and another barrier that prevents them from actually getting there. Um, yeah, go ahead. And I, uh, Maddie, one more question. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about here on the land, uh, there's a, another whole cycle of their life that goes anywhere from one to three years probably, and that is in the ocean. And the temperatures, the currents, and the food supply for the salmon, and where they're going, and how that's all affected. Are you studying that at all? So that's a great question, because up until, I mean, even now, there is not a lot known about what happens with salmon once they're in the ocean. We don't, we don't know a lot about what they're doing when they're down there. Uh, but just recently, uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, commissioned this huge study. It's like multi-country, multi-organizational study where they just sent out, and I want to say it was probably in September or October, a huge fleet that's going to be out there for two years or more solely to study what is going on with the, uh, the salmon in the ocean and where barriers lie in the ocean because we uh, don't know that much about them when they're in the ocean, but right now there is a huge effort like on a international level to study them and what they are doing in the ocean and, and how their numbers are being impacted in the ocean and what can be done on that front as well. Is, is that uh, just concerning salmon or food supply in the ocean for all life? Because of the plastic ocean, it's destroying a lot of things. Well, I think that because of the, like it is about salmon for that specific study and, and um, investigation, but because of the nature of salmon and how they are a keystone species, even in the ocean where they are again, both predator and prey and part of that ecosystem, I think in studying them, they'll find out more about the other animals and, um, organisms on that food chain and what is affecting them um, because salmon are also, you know, uh, prey of, of whales, of, of orca, of sea lions, of seals, of uh, all kinds of oceanic animals. And so in studying 
what's happening to the salmon, it's helping us understand what's happening to the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and that is again, why I brought them up as a keystone species is because yeah, oh, we're sound salmon solutions, but they're so integral to the whole ecosystem, all the ecosystems that they're in and the interconnectedness is so intricate that when we study them, when we work on protecting them, when we learn more about them, we learn more about the ecosystem that they're in as a whole and what we can do on, on a macro scale to help as well. Mandy, I got a question for you. You had yeah. mentioned about the Elwha River, which was a fantastic project. I followed it quite a bit. Um, I haven't, they did mention a whole bunch of other dam removal projects going on. Is there any ones that are other, I'm not just not going to be as significant as Elwha, but are there other ones that, uh, that are going on around here or just, does that seem to be like the um, trend for dam removals? There are, I'm not as familiar with the other like projects. There's a there are other ones that are going on. We do, I think right now, a lot of what we focus on is culvert removal um, because dam removal, there is so much litigation that's involved in each one um, that it mm -hmm. takes years and years to even yes. get approval to move forward with these projects. I know that there are other projects of dam removals in the area, but it it's a fight and there's always people on the other side, you know, energy and, uh, mm -hmm. agriculture and all this, you know, so there's a lot of back and forth in court before it even gets to the point that we can remove dams. Sure. Um, so well, a lot you of- talk about the, You talk about the culvert removal, okay, that sounds like a hyper-local type thing, almost a community type of uh, activity. It can what be. The, what are the benefits of culvert removal? So culvert remo removal, it's just another barrier. It's just another barrier that prevents the salmon or, you know, salmonids from getting to where they need to go. Uh, culverts, for those of you that don't know, are usually constructed uh, when they're trying to move water out of the way if they're trying to build a road or trying to build a bridge or trying to do any sort of development and there's like a river and they don't, a stream and they don't want it to be where it is, they build like a culvert and so they can direct that water to go in a different direction or somewhere that they don't want it to be. And it's just, it's just a barrier. It's just a, a way that prevents fish from passing and then it reduces the number of fish in that area. So it is more local, yes, but each culvert removal makes the stream that much more habitable for all of this fish species in, in that stream. Um, but it absolutely could be a community effort if you know of a culvert. I mean, I know one that I'm personally having talks with the city of Edmonds about because uh, our hatchery is at Willow Creek, our Willow Creek hatchery and it's on Willow Creek, like the Willow Creek, and it goes down into the Edmonds estuary and out into the river. And we used to have salmon that would come up, but there's a bunch of barriers that prevent them. And one of them is a culvert upstream. And so right now we're trying to figure out how to work with the city of Edmonds to get that culvert removed, but it is, it's a community effort. A lot of the community members in Edmonds are involved, we're involved. Um, but once we do remove that, once we clean up that wetland a little bit, that's right outside of the, the hatchery. And once we, there's also another barrier that there's like a, like an ocean gate, like floodgate that's broken. And so like at the, at the mouth of the Creek. And so there's, there's these barriers, right? So we remove them one by one, we mitigate them one by one, and then we have salmon return, but it is a, it's a community effort led by a lot of people in Edmonds that just, that just care. Um, I know that there's a couple people in Edmonds that created an after school club for high schoolers called Student Saving Salmon. And we they come in, they come to our hatchery quite a bit. They volunteer with us quite a bit. Um, and they're also part of the coalition to kind of get that culvert removed. So that is a great example of community members <clears throat> taking action and, and helping to restore a creek in their watershed, in their community that is has the potential to be salmon bearing, was salmon bearing in the past, um, and that we would like to see be salmon bearing in the future. Thank you. So what we do at Sound Salmon Solutions is three faceted. I mean, we do a lot of things, but uh, we have three kind of main departments um, and there's a huge amount of overlap. Uh, we have our education department, which is, um, the, is my department. And we provide a lot of hands-on experiential education. Uh, we take kids through adults 
into the streams, into the wetlands. We take them to our hatcheries. We take them to various locations and we teach them about water quality. We teach them about salmon biology. We teach them about the watershed science and, and what goes into it. Um, and it, it, we have incredibly, we have an incredibly broad network of education uh, programs at Sound Salmon. It's one of the reasons I'm so grateful to work here is because of those RFEGs listed before, like I talked about Nooksack being a bigger one, we have one of the most extensive education programs of all of them. Um, so it's, it's a pretty impressive uh, network of programs that we have for education. And we do work with all ages. We've got elementary, we've got middle school, high school, we have an adult education programs, we have volunteer events that are educationally focused. Uh, we have all kinds of different targeted programs for community groups. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that to in, here in a minute. Um, because I think the education department is the most kind of extensive, like we, we have a, the most widespread uh, but the habitat tends to do the bulk of like the work work. So like in our habitat department, they do a lot of that restoration. They do the culvert removals. They do uh, invasive species removal. And I'm not sure if everyone knows what an invasive species is, but um, it can be a plant or an animal. A lot of times we're working with plants. There are a couple of invasive animals that we're trying to also mitigate for, but uh, things like reed canary grass, which I don't know if you driving by a stream or wetland and it looks like a bunch of like, like straw or like, a, like wheat almost looking grass stuff that kind of overtakes it. That's reed canary grass. It's extremely invasive and it chokes out a lot of our native plant life. So that's one of the big ones we get gone. Um, the Himalayan blackberry, another huge, like constant, I want to say war that we're waging against Himalayan blackberry. It's quite the battle. Uh, and I don't know if we'll ever fully eradicate it. So we're also, there's a lot of research going into, so how, if we can't get rid of this, how can we make it so that we can at least slow it down, stop its spread, make sure it's not hurting what we have going on so much. Cause at least with the reed canary grass, if we're planting native plants and trees, uh, there's different, like if they don't have as much sun exposure, they're going to die out. If there's like other grasses that are a little bit hardier that are native, they're going to outcompete. So there's there's more we can do with the reed canary grass. The Himalayan blackberry is a little bit more difficult to mitigate. Um, English ivy is another one that's really really hard. Um, I'm sure you can see it growing up trees and stuff all around. Um, if you see that, I'm giving you permission to pull it <laughs> off. Uh, <laughs> like most of the time I'm like, don't touch the plants, but if you see English ivy wrapping its way around a tree, you can pull that off. Um, that is a lot of what we do too, um, because it will kill the tree. Um, it'll wrap all the way around. It'll outcompete for the sun. It will, it has like little tendrils in it that go into the tree that kind of steals the tree's nutrients. Uh, it's, it's just, it's just gross. And the English holly is another one. Japanese knotweed is another one. There's, there's a lot of invasive plant species that it seems small, just going out and pulling weeds essentially, but it's, it's so hugely important that we get rid of them. And then we come back and we plant with native plants. Um, so our habitat team is also responsible for doing research and kind of figuring out what the best native plant spread would be for a specific area where they're doing that restoration that they're like, okay, well, I know there's a lot of reed canary grass, so I'm going to use this specific mixture of grass because I know that it helps prevent in this area or this area has a lot more sunlight. So Douglas firs will probably do a little bit better here for like buffer zones. And a buffer is um, like an area of land between, I don't know, a farm, the golf course, the road and a river or a wetland. And so that's just gonna be like 150 feet or 200 feet of like trees and plants and shrubs that are protecting the waterway from whatever pollutants it might encounter. So uh, that's also work that the habitat team does is they create these buffers. Um, and actually in Washington state, we do have extensive buffer laws uh, where for cer certain streams and like depending on the fish that are in them and wetlands, depending on the category of wetland it is, uh, we have to have a certain amount of buffer between anything and those waterways. 
What's tricky is that it's a relatively newer law. And so we have a lot of landowners that don't, it gets down to like that nitty gritty of like who, who has more jurisdiction, you know, these landowners that it's their land or like these, the, the statewide laws that are saying we have to have this buffer between your farm and, and, the, and the river. So there's, that's, that's some of the growing pains that we're going through right now. And a lot of times for the habitat, like the habitat manager, he will just call landowners like cold call in a region that he's supposed to be working in to see if they'd be willing to work with us and and allow us to create a buffer on their land. And it's really, I want to say, I want to give it a good 50-50. I want to say there are a good amount of landowners that are in like, okay, yeah, we'll work with you. We'll do it. But there, it is also sometimes a bit of a like, wow, I don't really feel that great after that call. Um, but it's important work because things like farms, especially with that fertilizer, uh, if there's not a buffer between them and a water system, that fertilizer just goes right into the water systems and like the, the manure and stuff. And it uh, creates an influx of nutrients in the, in the water systems, which create algal blooms. Have you seen any of the like big, like standing water where there's like huge algal blooms covering the top, um, like that green slimy stuff? Uh, that is usually caused by an influx of nutrients of fertilizer or of animal waste, um, that feeds that algal bloom. And they're like, oh, I love this. I'm going to explode. But then what happens is everything underneath that begins to die out, starting with the plants because they don't get sunlight. And then there's a lot of like bacteria that come and eat the decaying matter and they take all the oxygen out of the water. So then any of the, the animals in the water, the fish, they don't, there's not oxygen in the water, so they die. Uh, it also makes the water toxic. So if you see a big green algal bloom and you have your dog, do not let your dog drink that water. It will poison and potentially kill your dog. So it, it is, it, this is a problem that's actually a worldwide problem. It's happening everywhere. And so at least in Washington state, we have the most, some of the most extensive laws in the country that help mitigate against uh, that process, which is called eutrophication of water. Um, but that's kind of one of the reasons that these buffers are so important. Um, but that's also what a lot of what our habitat crew does is create these buffers, is do native planting, is do, uh, they rebank rivers. So there's not just like sediment sliding into the water from stripped banks. Um, they do culvert removals. Uh, they do woody debris installation because salmon really like little like logs in the river so that they can hide and like have places to like escape predators and like sit in a cool pool for a little bit before continuing their journey. Um, I don't know if you drive over I-5, you know, by kind of by Spencer Island, um, and you can see the logs that are purposely placed in the rivers. Have you seen those? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, those are, those were there set purposely for salmon. Um, and so that, that's a insula woody debris installation. That's again, a, a habitat uh, a facet or what's something that they do. And then the last thing that we do is, is stewardship. And that comes in a lot of different forms and it, and it overlaps with both education and habitat. And it's just, it's outreach to communities, it's fundraising, it's different events like the Polar Plunge where I met Marco and just different things where we get to engage with the community and just let people know everything that we're doing and let them know how they can be a part of it if they're interested. Uh, we, you know, we've got Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, We've got school groups, we've got uh, corporate teams. We just had a corporate planting on, I wanna say last Tuesday, where about 50 members of a construction company came out and they did planting with us, you know? So just ways that different, that even if you're not in the environmental sector, it's a way that you can participate and be a part of the larger action items that we're doing which is is incredibly important so our our stewardship uh section is is also incredibly um valuable and and um something we promote pretty heavily so then we also have our hatchery so we have a micro hatchery and when i say micro hatchery i think it's it can be a misnomer to a lot of people because we are raising 80,000 coho there right now, which seems like a lot of coho, right? Like that seems like a lot of fish, uh, but like places like Issaquah, the Issaquah hatchery has millions 
like millions of fish that they're raising. So that's why we're a micro hatchery. And our hatchery is mainly focused on education. So a lot of the fish in our hatchery end up going back to Issaquah where we get them. And then they have fish biologists there, which, which will then work on where they're released and, and such, because we get their, the eggs from Issaquah, we raise them in our hatchery, but they're still uh, have that instinct for their native uh, home rivers. So we bring them back to Issaquah. But the hatcheries is a huge educational tool. Uh, it's in Edmonds, it's a public park. So if you looked it up and wanted to take a, a little day trip down there, or I don't even think it's that long. It's only about 25 minutes from um, our office in Makotio. Um, there's some trails, there's the pond right now outside. Uh, we have our salmon babies in right now. So you can go and you can see the salmon in their circular pond out there. Uh, so it is a, it is an area that is open to the public that you can go and you can visit just on your own free time. If that's something that interested, if you're interested in, um, it, the facility relies heavily on volunteers. Uh, so I have a hatchery coordinator and since the, uh, ha hatchery is part of, is like, is the education center, it falls in the education department, which, um, is interesting because I don't personally know how to run a hatchery. So I hired somebody that does, which is, she's amazing. Her name is Kaylee Spencer and she's fantastic. And if you go down there, she'll, she'll most likely be there. She loves it down there. Um, but she coordinates all the volunteers. And so pretty much uh, all of the feeding of the salmon right now that we have in our pool is done by volunteers. And there's every year we have signups for that, that if you, it was something you were interested in once a week to go down and feed the salmon, um, next year, that's something that you could sign up for and do. You could go and volunteer at the hatchery. Um, it's a, it's a really cool facility and, um, there are a lot of events there. Oh, and I have this link because I wanted to show you the video. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, is it not going to let me right, give me one second. I want to show you this video. Um, of when so we, we get them as eggs and they're in, they start inside as eggs. And after they are, uh, hatched, they go into these troughs, uh, and it's still on the inside portion of the hatchery. It's over here. Um, but once they get to their fry stage, so they go through multiple stages. And when they're in the troughs, uh, in the trays and in the troughs are in their alevin stage, which means they have egg sacs and that's what feeds them. So we don't need to feed them. In fact, if we do feed them, it's actually, harmful to them. So we don't want to, don't want to feed them before they're ready. Um, but they just got to the stage where they have absorbed their egg sacs and they're now in their fry stage and they're now able to be fed. And, um, as a result, we were able to move them out into the, the pond, the circular pond, Hold on. I pinned it. I pinned the video just so I could find it. But it's a video of us sending the. Ah, here we go. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop this share. So these are the salmon they're getting shot out. They mm -hmm. go from the troughs into this pool. So they go down like this, this, this water slide essentially. So this is them in the troughs. They're literally being sucked down that tube mm -hmm. and it goes down here, down into our little water slide area until we get out to our larger pool out here where they are then kind of launched into our circular pool on that little water slide there that they go down. So there's a bunch of little baby salmon coming out of there right now. Um, these are volunteers that are helping make sure all the fish get down, make sure all they, they, they get all get out of the trough and then down into that water slide. These are some of the high schoolers that come and volunteer um, I think they're scooping out some of the, the dead babies before the, they're released. Um, these are volunteers that helped clean the pond before we filled it and started sending the salmon down into it. Um, yep, so that's them 
cleaning it all up. So this all happened in one day. So they cleaned it, they filled it, and then they released the salmon from the troughs into the circular, circular pool all in one day. So that's our 80,000 little babies getting ready to go down their water slides. And out into the water. At what point do they identify with the water supply to come All right, home? Hold on. That's, that's our, uh, that's our uh, hatchery coordinator that was talking just there. But sorry, what was the question? At what point do they identify with the water supply so that they return to their home area? You say that uh, in your micro deal, it's a local water supply. But did you take them back up and the Skagit and they're put up in there? So where, where do they identify with their home port? So that's a really great question. They identify with the, the water of, of Issaquah or around Issaquah because that is the, it's instinctual. So even though we are getting them used to our local water and that water is fed by Willow Creek um, and they are hanging out in there, their instinctual smell that they're going to look for when they're back out in the ocean is the, is the Issaquah water where they were laid because that is, that's their line so and that would have been what was inherent or rather the breeding took place yes exactly and once we return them to Issaquah they're in the Issaquah water for about a year before they let them swim downstream to the ocean so they're get they get used to the Issaquah water again before they go back so it's really hard to reintroduce them into a different water supply it is yeah it's very hard um, they're very, they're very particular about where they are. And that evolution happened very slowly and like over a very, very long period of time. And so for us to just expect them to change overnight is not realistic and not likely to happen. So we've got to figure out other ways to, to help them. And so we have them in our, in our micro hatchery for the educational purposes, but we bring them back to their home so that they have a, a chance of actually making it back to spawn. But yeah, also... Sorry. Yeah. Hey, Matt. What are the hours for the uh, for the public to visit the hatchery? I think it's general park hours. Um, I believe uh, it's dawn to dusk, but I I think Edmonds Parks close around ten p.m. So just general park hours. And there's a gate and it's locked, but you just can walk around it. It's just more so that there's limited space to actually drive your car down there. So we okay. don't want like tons of cars there all the time, but uh, you just park on the, uh, the outside the gate and then you can walk down to it. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. Reclamation of uh, wetlands. Um, I've read articles in the past uh, here in the, between Marysville, Snohomish and Everett, that, they, that area of the Snow Snohomish River. Uh, they were going to, or they were trying to reclaim a lot of the wetlands there. And what has happened with that? And there's an awful lot of farming going on and other usages of the land that's developed. So how does that, how is that going? Um, so that's a great question. There is still a lot of farming and development. However, I do have a little bit of information on that. They uh they breached the dikes around Spencer Island. So like where Union uh, Slough and Steamboat Slough kind of um come back and hit the the Puget Sound. They had diked a lot of that land there for farm use. Well, they reclaimed that land and they broke the dikes. And so now it's become an estuary again. And I actually was out there and did samples um from the class that I'm in in the fall and that water is now back to brackish, which is the salt and freshwater mix, which makes it an actual estuary. And it's uh, a huge uh, triumph in reclaiming like a big chunk of land and returning it to its natural estuary state. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but that is a, a, a great example of something big that was done that is actually helping the wetland return to its natural state. Um, is that what the dikes are along I-5? Mm -hmm. They just put in the last year. So. Uh, it might, I mean, it might be connected. I'm not entirely sure, but the, 
Um, do you know what I do? You know where Spencer Island is? You know what I'm talking about? Which Spencer Island? Spencer Island. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar. With do you know that. Union Slough and Steamboat Slough? Yeah. They, as they reach the Puget Sound, they wrap around this huge stretch of land right in Everett before they hit the sound. Yeah. And that's where there was a lot of farmland, but they, and they had these dikes and levees where they were preventing that water from hitting that plane and they yeah. broke them on purpose so that water could go back into that plane. And I mean, it's, it's acres and acres of land. Have you ever early morning in the fall driven down I-5 and there's like a huge wall of just like white <laughs> that's from the wetland that's been the estuary that's been reclaimed. Okay, so this part's pretty quick, but th we these are just different partnerships that we have. Um, I mean, we we partner with the Tulalip, we partner with the Stilla Guamish, we partner with King County, Snohomish County, City of Marysville, Department of Ecology, AmeriCorps, City of Lake Stevens, City of Duval. County Flood Control District, Conservation District, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. That's probably uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. It funds a lot of the RFEGs, and it's where we get a lot of our overhead is from WDFW. Um, the Snoqualmie, we work with Seattle City Lights, Washington Conservation Corps. We work with uh, regional the regional fisheries coalitions, uh, Adopt a Stream, Patagonia, like different um, outdoor. Uh, REC companies have a lot of investment in outdoor environments. We'll partner with them in various things. So there's all kinds of different community partnerships that we create and foster and work with because it just is such a monumental task that we're trying to undertake that it's just impossible to, to do for, um, for one organization. It takes, it takes everybody, it takes all of the, takes them all. Um, some of the programs that we offer, especially in our uh, education department, is we have our Salmon in Schools program. We have eight schools right now, ranging from elementary to high school, where they have 55-gallon salmon tanks in their classrooms, um, where they have, um, we gave them coho eggs, and they got to see the eggs hatch, and then wash them in the alevin into fry stage, and then they will get to release the the salmon into their watersheds um and there we have a whole permitting process that goes along with that um to make sure that they're in the right place and it's a incredibly important program i have met adults like older than me that did this program when they were kids and so just being uh able to see it kind of come full circle or have their kids also be in the classrooms where they're now doing the salmon in schools program is really cool it's a really um hands-on uh way to connect the kids to their watershed and 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 the um inhabitants there we also work with uh the entire marysville schools district all of their fifth grade classes we do a water quality program with them every year at jones creek um one of my um pet projects one of my most favorite things that we do is we work with snohomish county juvenile court um and we call it our yes program so youth exploring stream science and basically it's it's teenagers, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, that are first time offenders, um, but not likely to reoffend. And instead of spending time incarcerated, they spend time doing service learning with us. Uh, hugely important. Um, I've spent a couple of lessons with these kids already. And I've found, especially in environmental edu education, is that kids that don't respond to traditional school tend to respond like in kind in in, in environmental ed in non-traditional classrooms. I mean, these kids, the second, even the second time they came out, they had taken our stickers and they put them on their phones. Like, you know how important these phones are to them. They had our stickers on it. They were so excited to come back and be part of this service learning project again with us. So really important program that we're doing. Um, there's the CATS program, which is something I really wanted to talk about. That's our community action training school program. That's for adults and that's 16 and up. And it's a really, really cool thing that we're starting. We just launched the website or the page on our website for that. Um, 
the end of last week, but we partner with Mid Sound Fisheries and it is uh, like a, it spans from May to September and it's every third Wednesday. We have a class from six to 8 PM on like a Wednesday or Thursday night. And we have different scientists, activists, educators, leaders in the community come and, and do different lessons with us. Uh, and then we do various, uh, like two to three field trips where we go and we like do hands-on, um, applications of what we're learning. And then there is a, uh, service component where each, uh, individual participant, is required to do 50 hours of a service project in their communities. And we've had people do things like uh, rally the neighborhood for culvert removal or do campaigns against fertilizer influx into the water systems and various things that they're just doing in their in their neighborhoods and their yards. And we, we help them through that whole process. Um, it's an amazing program. We're going to host it at the hatchery, but we're doing a hybrid situation this year where the classes will be in person, but we will also be live streaming them so that if it's more comfortable or more doable to do it from your, the, at least the class portion from your home, that's an option as well. So that is now on our website to um, the CATS program. We also, we have our habitat restoration, like I was talking about. So you can see down in the bottom right corner, there is Rachel, one of our habitat technicians and like a huge cluster of uh, uh, English ivy that they just had pulled off that, uh, some trees in the surrounding area. Um, and then we have our volunteer events where we have the, you know, uh, corporate or different groups, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, church groups, uh, different rotary clubs will come out and do volunteering with us. Um, we also have field trip opportunities. We do stream and water quality science lessons. Uh, we have interactive, you know, we've had to adjust to COVID times as well. So we have interactive virtual excursions as well, you know, like online field trips essentially you can do. We do watershed modeling for the kids and we are going to pilot a summer club or a summer camp this summer. It'll be our first time doing it. We're starting with two weeks. It will be at Ed um, at our hatchery in Edmonds and it will be for fourth through sixth graders. Um, it's a week long day camp and we're gonna do two weeks of it. So we're really, really excited to start to uh, actualize that space in a way like we have a lot of, of, of ideas and, and utilize the space in a way that like fully encompasses its potential. Um, so it's a lot of what we were doing. Like I said, the education department is, is spread a little more wide while the habitat department is spread a little deeper. So they do kind of their main things, but it's, it's, it's a lot more like their region is huge that all the watershed and a half that they have in that area that I showed earlier. So um, we're doing a lot. These are all different ways that we take this approach that's like, we are, we are all responsible. We are all part of the solution. Um, and we all have the ability to get involved. Um, so just as part of our, our mission, you know, we're, we're promoting social, environmental, economic justice, ecological sustainability, economic equity within the context of our work and, and everything there that we do. It's, it's written into our framework of every grant that I write, of every grant that my, my people write, of every program that we have. We're trying to serve the communities that need to be served the most. Um, we focus like uh, especially my my juvenile court, my yes kids uh, is really again an important program um, for me. We're trying to uh, ensure that resources are available, that we're including everyone in public stewardship and in our education programs that we possibly can, and accommodate participants and their uh, different abilities. There there are different things that you can do if you can't go out and plant a bunch of trees. That's okay. There's something else that we can have you do. There's all kinds of different ways that you can get involved um, and be a part of it. Um, we're looking to help historically marginalized communities um, with education, internship, and employment. Um, a lot of our salmon in schools, schools are low income or tribal schools, and we tend to reach out to those schools first, especially if we have the grant money to do so, so we can provide them these, these programs for free so they don't have to uh, pay for it. And we, it's just something that the kids get to experience. Um, and then we also are, are utilizing low to no impact, 
sustainable practices in all aspects of our work from our office down to the equipment that we use. It's, it's a fully faceted thing. And then most importantly, we, in, we honor the indigenous people of the Salish Sea. We recognize, respect, and support their treaty rights. We acknowledge their forcible removal from their traditional lands, their subsequent marginaliz marginalization, their denial of human rights. Uh, and we work very closely with the tribes in a lot of ways. We talk to them a lot. We have a lot of contacts with them. We do a lot of partnerships with them. We do a lot of restoration on their lands for them. It's, it's a very important part of the work that we do at Integral even part of the work we do. Um, and again, just bringing it back around, we often like, it's such a huge problem that it can seem that we're powerless or don't have ways to change, but we at Sound Salmon are, are really striving to constantly develop and create ways for our community, for people to engage in their communities, for them to engage with us, to be the, the change that they wanna see, to be a part of the solution, uh, especially when we all, work together, especially when we come together for a common goal and, and are passionate about it. Like we, we may have been the problem, but we are most definitely a hundred thousand percent the solution. Um, so different ways that you can come in. Um, we have volunteer plantings. These can be found on uh, the events page of our website. So if you go to soundsalmonsolutions.org and click events, these where that's where you can find a lot of our uh, volunteer events. We have our CATS program, which again, I just launched on the website too. So you'll be able to go and just play around on the website. It's, I think it's just right at the top community action training school and you can click and there's a link to sign up and all that. And it gives, it's a full rundown of the whole program. You can follow us on social media that gives a lot of the information about the different work we're doing and the, and we spotlight different employees and such. So we've got our Facebook, um, our Instagram and our Twitter. Um, and then we have different stewardship events. We have Edmund Stewards is one of the things we do. We do Polar Plunge, we do Earth Day, we do Arbor Day, we do different things in the summer. There's all different kinds of ways that you can get involved. And then we also accept donations and we'll accept them through the website or in the mail. And especially if you specify like, this is for the hatchery or this is for the, the yes program, or this is where, uh, this is what I want these funds to go to. That's where we put those funds. So um, you can also do that through the website. You can also reach out, reach out to me, or you can, you can send a check to our office is um, another way that, that you can be participating. And I think what I'm going to end up doing is sharing this presentation with Marco, and then you can have all of that information yeah, for you. But yeah, that is, that's about it. Um, I, apologize I have to leave in probably about five minutes but I could take maybe like one or two questions well thank you first of all that was a lot of information uh yeah, I learned more than I thought when I was just looking just breathing through the uh the website to make sure I have an understanding but yeah you guys do a lot more and I really appreciate that information Any I noticed excuse me, that there was no island connected, island county. Um, my brother and sister ma are, uh, sister live over there, and I know that there is a, a salmon education program on the south end of Ridby. Do you know anything about that? I, I do not. I do not know anything about that. I know that is a region that we cover, but there, I mean, outside of the regional fishery groups, there are other organizations doing the work too. I, I'd be interested to learn more about that though. We're always looking for partnerships in, in that capacity. Okay, I, I might be able to get some information for you, so yeah, thank you. What do you do when you, you pass laws to protect the land for different things? And someone, well, there was an article about 15 years ago a farmer had a huge plot of land and it had been, they had cut the lumber and everything down and it, it ruined the land so far as you know, things go. So he went in, bulldozed it, set it out, spread it out and made it fish friendly. And they found out about it and they made him tear it all up. And, uh, it, it was really uh, against 
He was doing what was right for the fish and for nature. And yet the laws said he was wrong. And how, how do you, do you get into that litigation, that type of thing? It's, it's really complicated, um, but because of how intricate and specific and um, encompassing these habitats are, there you in order to actually create one of these habitats you have to have a wetland specialist uh, a habitat specialist uh department of ecology there's all kinds of permitting and planning that you have to go through just so that there's oversight making sure that every aspect of the habitat rehabilitation is met that if the plans and permits aren't applied for they're not filed correctly or they're not done right then unfortunately, yeah, we would have to go back in and remitigate uh, because if it was something that was farmland, there might be things in the soil that, that might not be accounted for. Uh, there might be different ways that we'd want to plant um, in order to uh, create the right balance of ecosystem when we are recreating uh, that habitat. And so uh, as much as you know, we love it when everybody's wanting to return there, you know, or like really help and be part of that habitat restoration. It kind of has to be gone through the right routes. Uh, otherwise, if it, you know, even one thing is off, but it like informs the rest, we have to go all the way back and restart. Well, makes it rough. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. There's, it's complicated. Washington had some of the most complicated laws in that regard. Um, and so there, there is a lot of regulating and, and permitting that goes into it um, that kind of helps prevent those kind of things or, or help them on the right track. All right, any more questions? Uh, anybody online? Just, uh, go ahead, unmute yourself real quick for one more question. All right, I saw that uh, um, Beth uh, signed up for your um, newsletter, so that's great. Uh, we all could do that. Just get, it's all about, like we, this whole eight week session is about communicating and talking and getting the understanding so that, you know, like we said, we, we've been talking is that one person can't do everything. It's a, it's a community. We start local and we expand and expand and just keep talking about climate change and how we can help nature out now instead of destroying what we've done in the past. By so. the way, welcome to God's country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not corn huskers. Oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I guess I am by blood, but I don't care that much. <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you okay uh thank you so much maddie uh we really appreciate you, you did a fantastic job yeah, thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it um i look forward to seeing some of you at some of our events in the future um but we'll be in touch uh, i do gotta jump off but thank you so much everyone for having me today i had a really good time and i love talking about what we do it so yeah, it definitely shows. So thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for uh, this eight week class. All right. Bye. Thank you.